the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Who Drove the Yellow Fokker Wolf? Challenge, Toss Bombing. And Metal Beasts, a European helicopter with an all-composite fuselage. Our guest today is the Eurocopter Tiger Strike Helicopter, located at BR 10.0. It was developed by a coordinated team from France and Germany, so both these countries have their own modifications of this aircraft. Let's start with the French helicopter placed at rank 7. A couple of turboshaft engines speeds this machine up to 300 kph. The protection of the cabin mostly consists of 20mm composite modules, plus the seats are reinforced with Kevlar, and there is an 8mm steel plate between the engines. As for the armament, this one has got a 30mm flexible turret and four hard points for external load. There, you can carry different kinds of missiles, the unguided SNEBs, the HOT-3, and the Hellfire ATGMs and the air-to-air -air Mistrals. The Eurocopter Tiger is also the first helicopter in the world to have an all-composite fuselage. Thanks to this, the machine's weight without external payload is only about 3 tons, which is a lot lighter than the Cobra or the MiG-24. Add a very smart rotor construction and receive a helicopter with excellent maneuverability that can make use of almost any environment. Plus, the composite materials provide good protection from machine guns and low-caliber cannons. When it comes to the missiles, the HOT-3 ATGM with a tandem charge warhead turns out to be a bit slow, but it can pierce the whole 1,250 millimeters of armor. It's one of the best penetration rates in the whole game. And even reactive armor can't always save you from this one. The Hellfire missiles have lower penetration, but they're much, much faster. And the Mistrals that you could have remembered from your experience with the Gazelle helicopter from the same French tree prove once again that you can rely on them when you want to fight any airborne target. As for the heavy caliber turret, it's an effective tool to use against light-armored ground targets or enemy helicopters. The French tree also has a premium version of this helicopter that will get you additional Silver Lions and boost your research of this country's tech. Moving on to the German version, that has a lot of differences, especially in armament. It also has got the HOT-380 GMs, but you can see the special German touch in every other way. Instead of the turret, there are two machine guns that you can install on those external weapon stations. If you take away some missiles, of course. There are also the guided Mighty Mouse missiles and the PARS-3 LR-80 GMs, an alternative to the American Hellfires. To finish up the list, there is the Stinger air-to-air -air missile, one of the most advanced and modern in the game. Its striking range is 1500 meters wider than the one of the Mistrals. The agility and the wide choice of offensive means makes the Eurocopters quite versatile. The powerful ATGMs give you an advantage over long distances, and in close combat, they can cope with both other helicopters and light ground tech. The only enemies that you want to avoid on this helicopter are anti-aircraft vehicles. Those encounters won't result in anything positive for your machine. The RAF were planning this ambush for a long time. They had to finally do something about that flight crew from the Jagdschwader 2 wing, 
That was defending the sky above La Havre occupied by the Nazis. Countless times, these German pilots tricked British cover fighters, disrupting bomber attacks on ports and factories on occupied French territory. Countless times, the British were trying to catch the darn Germans off guard and bomb them right on their airfield. But the commanding officer of that wing had some supernatural sense of coming danger. Not only did he always manage to relocate the planes to spare airfields, he was also meeting the attackers in the sky, with the whole of his unit behind him and dealing catastrophic damage to the British forces. Major von Graf, as he was called, and there wasn't a pilot in the RAF that didn't know about his yellow Focke Wolf 190. One of those pilots was René Mouchot, commander of the 341st Squadron of the RAF, consisting of the free French pilots known as Groupe de Chasse, Alsace. Mouchot had a long-lasting personal vendetta against von Graff, so that day he took everyone with him, including the soon-to-be-famous ace pilot Pierre Klostermann. By then, he was just a rookie sergeant with only one combat mission on his record. During the morning of July 27, 1943, lots of Allied planes crossed the English Channel to set up a trap for von Graff and his men. According to the plan, the Marauders and the Bostons set out to attack four German airfields around Le Havre at once. The Germans decided that it was yet another pointless strike and took off to intercept them. By that time, it was almost like a drill for them. The newest Focke Wolf 190A6 with their great climbing rate quickly appeared above the enemy Spitfire Mark 9, who didn't even think to change altitudes, simply flying as high as their bombers. Such fools these British and French, aren't they? Must have thought the German pilots. Eager to have fun, they dived, as they always did, right from the sun and realized that they were the fools all along. The Spitfires of the Alsace Group and other RAF squadrons darted in different directions and surrounded the Germans. And from even higher above, another attacking group was already diving to smash them. Nobody spotted them because of the cleverly used interference system. The hunters turned into prey in one second. They couldn't run in a straight line. The Spitfires would just fire their tails. They couldn't dive any lower. They were already at low altitudes, and going up would mean finding themselves under fire from machine guns and cannons upstairs. They had no chance in this fight near the ground. The newest Spitfire Mark 9s were easily tailing them and shooting them down one by one. Even the young Pierre Klosterman on his second ever combat mission grounded two enemies in one minute. But the most amazing thing happened a bit higher above the main battle. The leader of the German fighters in his yellow Focke Wolf witnessed this massacre and realized that he was finally outplayed. In fury, he attacked the nearest Spitfire, piloted by Lieutenant Martel. After a whole cascade of maneuvers, the fight between the irate von Graff and the French lieutenant came to a frontal attack. The powerful armament of the German aircraft didn't leave any chances to the British fighter but the French pilot was faster. A rain of bullets led to the explosion of the famous yellow Focke Wolf a second before it opened fire. The radio exploded with Victoria shouting, French, British, Australian, New Zealand, Canadian, American voices congratulated each other on defeating the hated yellow noses. And the enemy airfields were finally buried under Allied bombs. Winston Churchill himself sent a telegram of congratulations to the Alsace squadron. Of course he did. After nine fighters confirmed shot down, countless unconfirmed, and all those airfields bombed. But here's a strange part coming. Lieutenant Martel did shoot down a yellow Focke of Wolf 190 in front of dozens of witnesses and a camera gun. But after the war, it turned out that nobody named von Graff had died that day. Moreover, the whole of the Luftwaffe didn't have a pilot with a name like that. There was, of course, the famous Hermann Graff, but this one never flew a yellow Focke Wolf and served in a completely 
different unit. This story has long been considered a war historical paradox. For decades, the personality of this enigmatic von Graf was a subject of studies and analysis. But till this day, nobody can answer the question, who in the name of the Lord was he? British pilots remember him, but never saw his face. Ex-German pilots, on the contrary, have no idea why anybody would paint the whole of his Focke Wolf yellow. A yellow nose? Yeah, sure, no problem. But the whole aircraft? What's the point? But there was a yellow Focke Wolf, and Lieutenant Martel did shoot it down. So who was he? This von Graf. Maybe some of you know the answer. Lately, those who wanted to protect their battlefield from Stike Aviation received a lot of help in the form of absolute beasts with cannons, missiles and goodness knows what else. Now the pilots have to think of new ways to strike the target with missiles and still survive. Today though, we won't be talking about missiles. Instead, we'll try to destroy an anti-aircraft vehicle with bombs. Helping us today is a special maneuver called toss bombing. The idea is to drop bombs while the aircraft is pitching nose up and gaining altitude. It allows us to get closer to the target while staying under the radar even if the opponent has the most advanced detection systems. First, we'll practice in custom battles. Let's take a Soviet 2-2S bomber and four 500 kilogram bombs. Now we need to gain some decent speed. For example, by diving, or at least flying in a straight line. Approaching the enemy location at about 600 kph, sharply pulling up, setting a climb angle of 20 degrees and dropping the bombs. Now let's perform some evasive maneuvers while at the same time watching the bomb flying to the target. You can do this with a separate button, or just by pressing and holding the drop bomb button. Then the camera will follow the bomb on its own. And what do we see? The bomb flies almost horizontally, losing altitude bit by bit, but still doesn't quite reach the target. Well, it's a challenge section, isn't it? Nobody promised that it would be easy. We experiment with speed, distance to the target and altitude. It takes a very long time before the bomb lands near the enemy machine. Thankfully, there's enough explosives to do the job even if you don't directly hit it. Because of the way the bombs are fixed in the hard points, we can only use two bombs under the wings of this exact aircraft to perform toss bombing. But this might not be enough in real battle. So we'll take a more suitable aircraft, a faster one with more uh, streamlined bombs that will have a wider effective range. Until recently, our pick would be the Super Sabre, but now we'll take the Phantom II, the menacing newcomer from the latest update. This aircraft can go supersonic and what's even more important, the bombs here are located just where we want them. We go to custom battles once again to get used to its dynamics and experimentally find out the optimal angle, altitude and speed. Several dozens of tests and adjustments get us closer and closer to the ultimate test. And finally, we're ready. Let's get into the real battle. To make it more comfortable, we'll be targeting enemies at a capture point. The altitude is as low as possible, so that their radar can't see us. The speed reaches Mach 1, going up, and we've overdone it with the rudder. The bombs went too far and disappeared somewhere behind the end of the map. Okay, <laughs> let's try one more time. Repeat the trajectory, drop the bomb, maneuver once again, and look at the bomb camera. Four kilometers, three, two, one. It's a hit, hurrah! We'll let this player guess where the hell did that come from and go and take a short rest. After all, we spent a lot of time trying to make this one. 
but the challenge is accomplished. <laughs> Want to repeat it? The first message was sent by a player called Caleb Drake. Cargo Port is the best map Gaijin has added in a while. Really like it. Hi there, thanks for the comment. To you and all the others who've already checked Cargo Port out and written us about it. We're glad that you liked our work and we'll try to keep it that way in the future. A user called Shazi Danan asks, What is the difference between indicated airspeed and speed? Hello there. The speed that you usually see on your aircraft speedometer is your speed in relation to the air. And it's measured with a pitostatic system that indicates the air pressure coming at your plane. This is the one that determines the behavior of your machine in flight. And it's called the indicated speed. And then there is the speed in relation to the ground. The true air speed or with some corrections, the ground airspeed. It was quite hard to measure in the early days of aviation industry, but nowadays everybody can just use GPS satellites. And that's the one we usually just call speed. Indicated and true speed can be quite different depending on a lot of factors, say the wind or your altitude and so on. Then there is a question sent by Andrea Bocca. What's the battery countdown when you turn off your engine? Hi there. It indicates the time you have before your accumulator dies. When the engine is working, it constantly recharges the accumulator. But when you turn it off or repair, the battery starts to drain. If it runs out completely, you'll see a significant decrease of speed when rotating your turret or Aiming your weapon and your IR flashlight won't work at all. Another question came from FESWF11. If you turn your engine off, could you then become invisible to thermal vision? Yes, but not completely. When you turn your engine off, you dispose of the main thing that can reveal your position, a bright plume of hot smoke but you still have a hot engine that will be easy to see with a thermal sight until it cools off, of course. Sometimes the weight pays off, but mostly your mobility turns out to be more important than invisibility as you turn into a very easy target while standing completely still. And the last question for today was written by Happy Day. Which is better? the cheap night vision or the expensive thermal sights. Any thermal sight, even the simplest one, gives you a great advantage in battle, as you can use it to see things that are completely invisible to the naked eye. You might miss a camouflage tank with the best image intensifier existing, but in IR spectrum, you'll see it as bright as day. Well, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. So come on, people, subscribe to the channel, bombs away, and press that bell button. Now you gotta leave a like and tell us what you think in the comments below. See you in a week. <laughs>